Thank you, Holly. It's good to see everyone here. So welcome to Jedi Equinonics. I'm going to take you on a journey today, as Holly mentioned. Um, we will go into outer space and science fiction and the areas of the holodeck to the ocean space habitat, a portable underwater habitat that we've invented to go new places underwater. And uh, we'll bring this together to explain how these resources and environments can help foster justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the oceans. So um, without further ado, this initiative has been recognized by the U.S. National Committee to the U.N. Decade of Ocean Science and Sustainability. And two of our chief objectives are to meet some of the grand challenges of our time, to transform human engagement in the oceans, and specifically to generate knowledge, support innovation, and develop solutions for equitable and sustainable oceans, as well as to provide equitable access to data information, knowledge, technology across all aspects of ocean science and all stakeholders. So first in our journey, we'll take you to the UA Holodeck, a convergence catalyst for transdisciplinary research, education, and innovation. The vision of a holodeck comes from, as many inventions do, from science fiction. So uh, on the Starship Enterprise in Star Trek, there's a room. You can walk into the room. It can be a fantastical respite. You can see waterfalls and mountains. You can go hiking and experience them. Or it can be configured to be an environment where you're engaged with one another to uh, discover how to meet a challenge, how to get the spaceship out of the black hole that it's being sucked into, for example, uh, how to collaborate across time and space. And so about half a decade ago, after a couple decades of research, we argued that we should create a new kind of instrument, a new microscope or a new telescope and call it a holodeck. And that this holodeck would allow us to explore areas of personal connection, personal learning, the learning classroom of the future, the home of the future, the smart car of the future, and to allow individuals from diverse environments to work together to tell new stories. So, I'll share with you first the holodeck, and then we'll explore how that can be used in underwater environments. So this was the initial vision. Uh, we have social robots, a biologist here on the right with uh, AR, VR, um, a musician looking at the sonic properties of a DNA strand, and a 3D printer instantiating that in physical form. So you see here many different aspects, social, emotional, relationships between individuals and artifacts, and rich data for learning and invention and discovery. So how do you build a holodeck? First, we found uh, we, we're basically bringing together the visual. So this is one example of the visual. This room, in fact, is a very good example of the visual. So the visual can occur in the you know, remote screens, or it can be placed in front of your eyes with ever-increasing um, pixelation here. So we're getting to the point where you might be soon unable to distinguish the difference between the pixel resolution and the breadth and depth of a screen right in front of your eyes. And one of the interesting things you can do with that is you can look right through this. So I could see you, even though, and you could see me, but we could also augment all kinds of in, in information both around me and around you. I might know more about who you are and what you're interested in and why you came, and you would know more about what I would be interested in sharing. Uh, so we have the visual. We have the auditory. Here's another example of the visual. The auditory, high-end music studios, uh, surround studios. You've got pretty good audio here as well. Um, this is about the area where most of these environments tap out. They have the visual and the audio, but they don't go further. They don't go into the physical. And with physical, we have three different kinds, at least. You can know where my body is. So I could swipe these screens instead of clicking here. I might change the screens. And so we, you know, so you know, and um, in a moment you'll see how we're using this in dance. Um, physical also has the physical fabrication. So if you need a new part, in this case, uh, you're a surgeon and you want to better understand the intricacies of doing surgery on a child's heart, a very delicate process, and you want to understand how to get it right, you might want to print out that heart and see it and visualize it and hold it and meditate on it and understand how you are going to use your tools and expertise to improve the conditions of this life and this family uh, that you're serving. 
And also physical, um, physical in the form of robotic. So we have social robotic interactions. These robots, humanoid robots, are one form of those. Roombas that we're all familiar with, smart cars that may drive and pick us up. Um, likewise, uh, things that we might not see. With, once we're in these immersive environments, we may have drones. I need some water. Oh, it might just fly the water right over here. I may not even see that. I would just be able to take a drink. Or I could draw you a picture of a drink that I could offer you. Right? You know, and these would be ways of interacting in a holodeck with future reality. So we got the physical, um, we got the audio, we got the um, visual, and then we have the physiological, which provides the human dynamics. So we got eye tracking, brain computer interaction, skin conductance, respiration, cortisol, blood heart rate, you know, all of these things happening. And once you have the human dynamics for an individual, you have the potential for social dynamics across individuals. We could see when you are all excited, when you're bored, whether I should pick things up a little. Those are all possibilities here. And then likewise, we have the ability for team dynamics in critical workplace settings and in social interactions. We could better understand ourselves and each other. So here we see a suite of humans training to be better nurses, better physicians, with humanoid robots that have diverse conditions. And we can better understand whether and go beyond competency to creativity. If there's not the resource at hand, could I maybe 3D print it or bring it, make it available to myself or be more creative in my everyday interaction here? Can I also do leadership? If somebody's failing, I could either notice that and bring them up to become more competent or marginalize them at this moment so that I can ensure the well-being of the humanoid robot or the human eventually. Uh, so these are forms of um, competency going beyond competency to creativity, collaboration, and leadership. Behind all of that, you have the infrastructure that brings it together. So looking at the socio-technical aspects of AI and how to minimize bias and ensure that we get the kinds of smart technologies that we want to, to drive these interfaces. And important to that is involving the diverse communities that appreciate and understand these data sets and the world that we live in in ways that the technologists don't and can't unless they are inclusive and embrace the full vision of humanity and society and all the answers that are given by all of us to the future that we want to live, not only the future that technologists want to build. So this is an example of the kinds of things that we're doing with, this, uh, with the holodeck, Stellarscape, a story of a massive star from its birth to its death. And so enabling dancers and technologists and, and the audience, and you'll see this here today, you'll be able to use sensors and interact with the stars. And so we really are telling a story about the human condition, humanity, and life in the universe and our ability to appreciate that in ways that transform our experience and give us new appreciations for the heavens and the world. And in a moment, the oceans. So I welcome you back here. Um, I think it's 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock is a full performance of Stellarscape. And then uh, 3 o'clock, we have the director's presentation for that. Which brings us to the ocean space habitat. So this portable underwater tent has been in development for about 20 years. This is a picture from 2012 of National Geographic Expedition in which we were able to bring a flexible, it's a vinyl diving bell, if you will, uh, habitat, anchor it at 30 feet of water in the Bahamas and go to 450 feet of salt water uh, to make new discoveries. So here's a little picture of my colleague, Mike Lombardi, diving to 410 feet, I misspoke. Um, and what's important about that is you can go deep, but you can't stay there very long unless you have a place that you can stop on the way back up. And that's what the habitat provides. It gives you a shelter that allows you to stay longer at depth and then also process items that you may have collected before bringing them to the surface where the pressure differences may have destroyed some of the artifacts and understanding that you may get out of this. So this is how he's anchoring it. You anchor it, you put a little air in it, it floats up, it, you get it to the right depth, uh, you fill it up to the volume that you need to be inside, and then you go on your dive. And uh, in this case, he went to 410 feet, much further than most of us will ever go. Um, but uh, you know, this is beginning to make that much more feasible. And then he comes back up here, in this case, for 80 minutes. He sits here almost an hour and a half um, in a environment where he can process samples, um, take a break, um, but most importantly, off-gas the gases that were 
put into his body by being so deep. Um, and I won't get into the physiology too much, but basically the longer and slower you can take coming back up, the safer you will be. And then certainly, as you all know, don't fly for 24 to 36 hours after that. So um, that's the initial picture. But let's take a little bit deeper look what this kind of technology and opportunity provides. So on the far left here, um, for some of you, <laughs> um, we see uh, scuba diving. So this is scientific diving, uh, two or three people, shallow depth. Uh, you can get up to 100, 150 feet. Um, you know, 120 is the, is the recreational diving limit. You can get to those depths for um, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, the deeper depths. At the shallower depths, you can be there for up to an hour and a half. So if what you want to learn about is in that very shallow area, scuba diving may be a good way. But you can only, you know, in a given day, you can only go there two or three times, spend two or three hours at that depth. That's a short day for most of us, you know. And whereas tech rec diving here uh, in the second panel allows you to go much deeper, much longer, but you have to carry, this person has five tanks on them. They have three on the bottom here and two on the back, maybe more, we can't really see, um, but they're very encumbered by all of this infrastructure and all of this um, takes both a lot of cognitive bandwidth and load. It's hard for them to dive in this environment. They're going deeper, it's more dangerous, so they're bringing all this extra stuff to be safe. Um, and they need all that stuff to take the long time that it takes to go back. But they're still going to be in the open water, and they're going to be hanging onto a line. Forget if this picture actually has it, but I'll, I'll make believe that that little white line might be the line. You're hanging on one little line um, to the surface, and you're, that's what's controlling your depth uh, along, you know, you can go up and down. But that allows you to hang out there for the two, you know, the night 90 minutes or potentially much longer, four to six hours if you, uh, for deeper dives. The third panel here is a ocean, underwater ocean station. This is the Aquarius station. This is the world's only scientific uh, underwater station dedicated to science, and it's been off the coast of Florida uh, for the past 25 years. It's large, heavy, expensive, and it's been in the same place for that entire time. Therefore, you can do certain interesting work on human factors and missions. NASA uses it about every year for a simulated space mission in a, um, in a rigorous, extreme environment. But the area around it is very limited in the sense that you can only go so far away from the habitat. You can't really go up or down, per se. Um, and, it, the, and everything has been discovered in that area for the past 25 years. So it's going to be limited in what you can learn uh, using this kind of infrastructure. And again, the, just to put this in perspective, you can go diving, you know, a couple hundred dollars. You can go tech rec diving, beginning into the thousands, couple thousands. Um, this is $10,000 a day plus, you know, and people stay uh, per person, and you're staying with four or five people, and you're staying for two weeks to a month. So much, much longer time, which is great. Um, for the kinds of things, you, if you're going to do archaeology and uncover a wreck, you'd like to be down there for that long and have that amount of time. But you're also um, spending a lot of money uh, and a lot of infrastructure and support to do that. So that's where the ocean space habitat comes in play. This is currently, you saw, about uh, the size for two people. But this can be configured into a, you know, a small, um, a, you know, like a four-person tent or a six-person tent. You could have modular airlocks between several of these. And this could be placed um, anywhere in the world in um, you know, up to a couple hundred feet. And so we've actually packed this into our carry-on luggage and brought it to diverse places. So that's how I got to the Bahamas. Um, and in this next case, we brought it out to Ambrose, where this is shot last summer on Shark Week Discovery. So I encourage you to watch the episode. Uh, it's the great hammerhead shark. And the shark researchers were able to use the tent um, in a way that camouflaged them from the shark. So they were no longer scared to get close to a new, strange human in the water. Uh, but they are able to swim up to this uh, tent because it's a, a buoyant, uh, quiet object in the water. You know? And so the researchers inside can do a kind of observations of these sharks that they've never been able to do before. This was a 10 and a half hour dive. So they're able to stay there for much longer. And they're able to come and go from the, from the habitat. And um, so they're able to move in and out of the habitat, witness the natural lives of these sharks. What they'd like to do is spend two or three days or longer in these environments. And again, this is a different environment than the first one, or even than the Aquarius station. There's not great hammerhead sharks. They're just not part of that 
environment. Uh, so you're not going to discover their life quality or many other things in the oceans unless you can get these kinds of stations out into the places that you want to make those discoveries. And we'll see later in the talk all the very exciting places that you'd like to make kind of those many discoveries. So what we're doing at University of Arizona is using these two technologies, the Holodeck, uh, experiential supercomputing, which allows us to connect with anyone in the world and have these fantastic technological experiences, and bring that underwater into Biosphere 2, where we have an ocean about an hour away from campus, up in Oracle, Arizona, um, where Biosphere 2 was a three-acre spaceship that was built in the 80s, 90s, uh, 80s, and um, had people live in it for two years, uh, and trying to understand, if we go out into space, how big a portion of Earth, a small biosphere 2. Biosphere 1 is the Earth. Biosphere 2 is the amount of Earth that we would take with us if we were on a long-term space mission to be sustainable. And so this is a research environment where they built this ocean. Uh, so this is a saltwater ocean. It has coral, and, and uh, we are able to put our habitat in it. And then because it's very calm and controlled, we can start to prototype how we get the underwater habit, the holodeck, into the underwater habitat and make it useful. So right now, over the past two months, um, we've deployed this here, and over the next, uh, and by the end of semester, we'll be um, hosting 12 to 24-hour missions, doing phys physiological sensing, and starting to create 3D environments to explore, to invite all of you to come on our missions with us. Uh, so check back around that time frame uh, with Jedi Aquanautics at University of Arizona. Anybody can email me, uh, win at arizona.edu, W-I-N, so very simple. Um, but that brings us to this combination, bringing all of this technology into the underwater tent for the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion that it can foster. So when we connect with diverse communities and embrace their power to create their own discoveries on their own terms and tell their own stories about those discoveries, we can have much broader and more inclusive understanding of the ocean and our futures in our planet. There's an important piece that it was the, the attention getting step that I missed at the beginning, which is as we interact with the world, we appreciate all of our interactions and our interactions with each other. But most of us don't realize that over 70% of the world is covered with the oceans. And over 80% of that has not been explored. And so these kinds of technologies allow us each of us potentially to have greater ability to explore those environments, but then also to share all of those explorations with each other so that we can create a common, uh, more collective understanding of our relationships with the oceans and uh, with each other. So we have reached out to the Tektide 2020 conference and the Women of Sea and Space. These are women aquanauts and uh, women astronauts who have been very significant in the areas of exploration that they've been advancing. And so these are individuals that we've connected with to help form the future of Jedi Aquanautics. Uh, likewise, with the National Association of Black Scuba Divers and Diving with a Purpose, uh, these individuals are committed to um, exploring slave wrecks and um, unearthing them and understanding the past and present histories and cultural uh, trajectories of these and telling those stories on their own terms. So uh, we've also been connecting with um, uh, di diverse communities with diverse abilities, people with blind and visual impairments, with uh, physical impairments, uh, and um, with diverse um, audio. And so this, the American School for the Deaf, who've also been using and exploring um, diverse sonification and visualization. So helping all of us better understand what is discovered and how we can appreciate it in, in multimodal aspects. And that's another element of the holodeck. Because it has so many different elements and modalities, you can start to appreciate how it can um, augment all of our experiences. And once we have better understanding of each other and, and our abilities to do things, we have new ways of understanding things. So we also go out into the expressive modalities. As you saw with Stellarscape, we've connected with um, Liz Kanner and the Lost City of Myrrh, which is creating virtual and visual scenarios underwater, exploring these environments and telling stories around them where you can start to remediate a reef and um, past and future histories of these environments, looking at how long. Uh, so the last glacial minima was um, in 2,000 years ago, the 
at 350 feet off the, the LA coast, there are caves that were in, probably inhabited by the indigenous communities in that time frame. And so that's approximately the same amount of depth that all, if there was a, uh, all the glaciers and fresh water melted, we would likewise in LA or at sea level be 350 feet underwater. And so this kind of gives us a past of 20,000 years or a current and present of how long will it take if we get there. Uh, you know, so this is kind of the trajectory and kind of understanding that can be fostered both in the physical realities by getting us into those environments, but also in these virtual and digital environments that can help us better understand what are the most important things that we can discover here? Can we do it in ways that are active and engaging at all age levels? And can, can we have individuals through contests and participations um, participate in their own invention of what they'd like to do underwater in these environments. So we've reached out to NOAA and the Department of Energy and looked at new ways for gathering ocean and wind energy and looking at how the underwater habitats can help to, um, to understand the, um, both the underwater ecology, but also the uh, maintenance and facilitation of these facilities. And then a really exciting one is the new ways to understand underwater forests. So when there's a big storm, like a Category 4 or 5 hurricane, um, there have been times when all the mud underwater has moved out of a forest that was buried 60,000 years ago. And so this is a newly present forest that was sub... Um, sub mud, if you will, you know, like it was below the bottom of the ocean. And then with the storm, it was available for a short period of time um, and you could dive there. And what's so exciting about these is that it, there's a very unique um, microbe, microbial system that has new forms of chemistry and new biology. So you can do uh, biopharmaceutical prospecting in much the same way that we appreciate the diverse uh, chemistries and capabilities and chemicals of the rainforest or other diverse uh, environments, we can appreciate wood underwater and its diverse lifetimes to be a resource for our own health and well-being, not only uh, of the planet, but, um, but of, of our societies as well. So, um, Jedi Aquanautics, an ocean shot, recognized by the U.S. National Committee to the U.N. Decade on Ocean Science and Sustainability, seeks to create a suite of toolkits in which we have an underwater station, the first three circles in the Nautilus, if you will, are the basic life supports. Uh, the center here is the holodeck where we can take everything that we learn here and connect it with the rest of the world. Um, and then each of the other habitats, if you will, can be part of those airlock systems I was talking about. You can have a medical suite. We're doing this spring the physiological experiments that will allow us to, with more greater confidence, go deeper and longer and better understand our own physiologies. Um, the archaeology that will help us better understand the cultures and communities. And the archaeology very much by those communities that have vested interests, their own heritage, and taking, you know, embracing the inclusion of those communities from justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, Remediating environments, so looking at toxic and nuclear environments that have uh, um, been, uh, that the ocean has succumbed to and helping us to better understand the impacts and mitigation of those. And then advancing technologies underwater so that we can go uh, deeper, further, make more discoveries through underwater sensors and robotics, as well as the bioprospecting that I talked about in the forest and how we can do genetic sequencing underwater. That's a, was done for the first time about five or six years ago. Uh, we can now make it ubiquitous through this kind of environment. Um, we can have autonomous, in addition to the habitats, we can have um, ambient pressure submarines to bring people uh, to and from the habitat. Um, so this is a model of the habitat and then the sensor systems outside of the habitats. So that's a brief introduction to um, Jedi Aquanautics and our vision for transforming hu human engagement in the underwater environment, uh, meeting two of the grand challenges of the ocean decade, the, to generate knowledge, support innovation, and develop solutions for sustainable oceans, and to create equitable access to the data, information, knowledge, and technology across all aspects of ocean science and all stakeholders. So I welcome you to contact me, to get involved, um, to learn how you can be a part of the Jedi Aquanautics vision and the ocean shot for the next decade and next century and our society. Thank you. I welcome any questions.
Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, um, with the temporary diving bell, how can it be inflated? And what we need to be able to do is first anchor it, because if you inflate it without anchoring, it'll just go to the surface, and that's not as helpful, because you can go to the surface, hopefully, or not, uh, depending on your uh, depth and how long you've been there. But um, once you've anchored it, um, and there's several different strategies there, you can put a small amount of air at depth, and that air will expand as it rises. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's, that's part of it. The other part is even if it were at the higher elevation uh, or, or shallower depth, if you will, you could um, put a tank of air into it. It takes one or two tanks to uh, fill this size habitat. Uh, you do want to recycle that air um, uh, once or twice a day uh, just because it gets humid and... Um, and um, it's important to do that. But more significantly, and I didn't talk about this too much, is that we've invented a um, scrubbing device that works like a rebreather. So the rebreather is used for an individual that um, scrubs the CO2 that they produce and provides new oxygen. But we're able to do that in the habitat. And that's really one of the key parts of the invention, which is that you can have fresh oxygenated air in this habitat for 12 to 24 hours, if not uh, longer, much longer, two to three days or a week uh, as we build new scenarios. But the specifics of the inflation is just putting a little bit of uh, air. We actually have a little button. We fill it up, and it gets bigger and bigger.